So, how many of you are project managers? Good, good question. And translators, actual translators? Okay. And how about um, people who purchase translations? So, we're all providers. So, we're all part of the provider team. And other, somebody who's neither a translator nor a project manager? Quality control. And you? A teacher. Oh, good. There's one other. I know. I also teach translation. One of those horrible people who actually thinks that theory, translation theory, is relevant. Oh my goodness. I, you know, usually, you know, you have to be careful saying that in public. You have to make sure that you're not too far from an exit. So, um, the theory on which uh, this presentation is based, and I need to hand this to Demi before I forget. This is what I promised you earlier. Yes. So, the theory is called functionalism. Now, there are many translation theories that are useless to translators, but this is one theory that is useful. And I've participated over the last 20 years or so in the development of this particular translation theory, which is quite, quite practical, actually. <clears throat> I believe that this will relate to Mr. Esselink's presentation because I will, I will define, I will end up defining quality. Translation quality. You say, oh, there is a brave man who is actually going to attempt to define translation quality. Well, let's uh, start out by uh, inviting you to help me come up with a definition. What is translation quality? We just, we had, uh, before lunch, we had a very interesting presentation from Hewlett Packard Corporation by Alison Toon, who talked to us about translation quality. Now we've had an interesting presentation by Bert Essling about translation quality. So we've had hours of discussion. So what is it? What is translation quality? Yes, there we go. This one. Aha, uh -huh, interesting. Yes, okay. Translation quality is that which translation quality models measure. That which is measured by translation quality models. Interesting. Okay. The, um, um, it's, it's, it's no problem. Actually, um, I, I can go ahead without, without the slides. If you get them working sometime, but no pressure. No pressure. I'll just talk. Okay. I'd like to propose that there are five aspects to translation quality. The same five aspects there are to quality in other industries. This is based on research by professors in business schools who have tried to synthesize the notion of quality. And the five aspects are transcendent, I'll come back to these, transcendent manufacturing, user, value, and social. Five aspects to quality. I have not invented these. These are well established, but the translation industry has not really paid much attention to the research that goes on in business on the notion of quality. So, transcendent quality. How does this apply to translation? Transcendent quality in general means some kind of absolute quality that is independent of what anybody thinks or any time or place. This is actually very deeply rooted in our notion, in our intuitive notion of translation quality. Somehow we think there is an absolute. You give it a source text and a target text, the translation, and you should be able to look at the two and without knowing anything else, say, is this a high quality translation, some kind of absolute notion of translation. We try to, we try to say oh, it's relative, it's relative to this, it's relative to that, 
but we always come back in our minds to thinking translation quality is absolute. Is it accurate? Is it fluent? Is it a direct, is it an accurate correspondence to, does it have an accurate correspondence to the content of the source text? I'm avoiding the M word. I will try not to use the M word. M, meaning? No. Mm. That's, uh, that's very problematical. So, but does it correspond to the content of the source text? Does it correspond, um, actually, does, is it, does it read as if it were not a translation? We hear this all the time, right? Does it, does it read like, as if it were written by a well-educated native speaker of the target language, so that you cannot, no trace, no hint that it's a translation. These are the, this is the notion of absolute quality. Transcendent, the transcendent quality of translation. Now, the second is manufacturing. In the manufacturing world, quality is measured almost universally. And this is, <clears throat> this is behind the ISO 9000 series which is more tied to manufacturing. And it's measured how? According to specifications, the manufacturing specifications. Does it meet, satisfy, comply with? It's all the same thing. Does it match? You can say it in many ways. But here you have the specifications. This particular object must be exactly four millimeters wide, 17 millimeters long, it must weigh 42 grams, you know, that kind of thing. When it's finished, it must have these properties of strength, and that's a manufacturing notion of quality. And that's actually very important in translation. What are the specifications? How does this apply to translation? Does it match the, is it appropriate to the audience? for which the translation is intended. If the translation, if the document was intended to be read by six-year-old children, and it's written in a very academic, high-level academic prose, which can only be understood by graduate students, well, then it's a very bad translation, right? No matter how elegant it is, it's a bad translation because it does not meet the specifications. Or what if it does not accomplish the purpose? If the purpose is to help you repair a machine, to fix a machine that's not operating properly, no other aspect of it can compensate if it doesn't actually allow you to fix the machine. A small mistake that would be irrelevant in another context for another purpose could make it a terrible, horrible, unusable translation. It could even cause harm to the person who is fixing the machine. If it tells her to do something which puts them into danger. So that, so the purpose is, of course, we all know this, the purpose. So the audience and purpose and many other specifications. The research that we have done in the context of ASTM International, which is a standards body, and my academic research combined with industry experts for the last 10 years have come up with 21 parameters. That uh, each one gets a value and that gives you the detailed manufacturing specifications for a translation project. They are all relative. None of them are absolute. None of them have fixed answers that are always the same. Oh, that looks something like my slides. We'll come back to it. Yes. We'll, we'll come back and use that for a summary. Yes. Um, so then we have, um, let's put, um, let's turn off the slides for just a minute, but show me how to turn them on again. Well, no, let's not do that. Let's, let's, um, we'll just put it to the beginning. There we go. Ah, there we go. So, oh, by the way, my name is Alan Melby. I am the editor of an ISO standard. Uh, it's actually a technical specification, TS, ISO 11669. And what I'm presenting to you is the theoretical basis behind this ISO document, which will be published 
in the first quarter of 2012. It's in its final stages of editing. I am a translator. I actually have done translation work fairly recently uh, in the commercial world. I'm a French to English translator. And I am, I know this will, most of you will stop listening when you find this out, but I am a professor of linguistics. But please, please give me the benefit of the doubt and listen to what I say anyway, even though I'm a professor. Thank you. Okay. So we have, so, so far we've talked about transcendent quality, which is independent of audience or purpose. It's just, is it accurate? Is it fluent? Which is sometimes needed, sometimes the most important, but as we've heard multiple ways today, not always the most important. For it to be truly fluent, sound like a native speaker wrote it, is not always the most important criterion. But there is the transcendent, there is the manufacturing, and then there is the preferred. The user aspect of quality. Is the user satisfied? There is a great article in Multilingual magazine. How many of you have ever seen this magazine? It's um, it's uh, I mean I don't think there's a Russian a Russian edition, but it's uh, quite well known in the English speaking world. An article by Wayne Borland of Dell Computer, who is in charge of their translation operation. It came out um, maybe six months ago, and it was how important it is to take into account the end user, the person actually reading the translations. It, they found that if their quality measures within Dell, they have quality metrics, but they don't always produce a translation uh, even though it scores high on their, on their metric, it doesn't always satisfy the end user. Well, what's going on there? Does that mean you shouldn't have internal metrics? No. It means that the specifications were wrong. You can, just because it has manufacturing quality, just because you match the specifications does not mean the specifications were good. You can match very bad specifications and produce thousands of useless objects that they all match the specifications. So it's not enough to match the specifications. You have to evaluate the specifications in terms of end user satisfaction. Then there is the, the value. Well, we'll do the social first and then the value. Social, the social aspect is what is the effect on society? Does, do people get hurt? This is especially important in the medical translation world. Is any patient going to be injured because the user interface is not adequate? Or the instructions on the medicine? There were many babies that were that became ill because of a translation error on the labeling of a of some baby product, which was given and the dosage was translated incorrectly, and they received too much and they became sick. So what is the the, the baby never read the translation, so there was no direct end user satisfaction question, but there was a social issue. Is society harmed in any way because of your translation? Now, it's not usually the case, it's not usually a factor, but when it is a factor, it's enormously important. It can lead to lawsuits, it can lead to loss of human life, which of course is much more important than money. And then the fifth is the, um, the value, OES, value. We don't, we don't like to talk about that because it actually involves money. But the most important aspect of value quality is this. Most comparisons of the cost of a translation by one provider or another are completely bogus. They really are not useful. Why not? Because those comparisons are comparing translation A, which was done with this set of specifications, versus translation B, 
which was done with a whole different set of specifications. If the specifications are not identical, a price comparison has no meaning whatsoever. Yet most price comparisons are done without even putting forth the project specifications. Think about that for a minute. People decide which vendor to use without even making sure that they have the same specifications for the project. And that's where, high, where really serious translation companies lose out because they are using a different set of specifications. They would actually satisfy the end user better. Then the, the final, final set of, uh, a final aspect of specifications in uh, value is that the company must be able to deliver a translation that matches the specifications. Even if you don't, even if you use the same specifications, you actually have to be able to satisfy them. Only if you have two companies that can both satisfy the same set of specifications, which includes delivery time and, and all of that, then you can have a meaningful comparison of price. But only then. And it's very seldom that you have both of those factors involved in a price comparison. So that's value. But only when you have the ability to follow the same specifications. So, let's, um, let's look at a few slides and um, I think, uh, Dimit, how long, uh, when is this session supposed to end, this particular session? In five minutes? Five or ten? Okay. Good. So I'll just take a few minutes to go through the slides and then uh, invite you to uh, make comments. Hmm. So here's a summary of what I was just talking about. The five aspects of quality, transcendent manufacturing, user value, and social. Hmm. The translation parameters that we've developed over the last 10 years or so are divided into four categories. Linguistic, those are the traditional ones. Production tasks, it's always also relevant who's doing what, what tasks are being performed. Because if a translation project, if one, one set, one bid, one estimate for the cost involves a bilingual review and proofreading, but the other one doesn't, ex ex expects the customer to do it, well then they're not comparable, right? So you have to know what tasks are being performed. <clears throat> the environment includes resources, what transla translation memory files are being used, what glossaries or terminology databases, and so on, what technology, and then relationships. Uh, that recently reset to stage zero, I don't know where that came from, another slide, it migrated from another slide. The relationships include <clears throat> things like when the translation is due and how much it costs. Here are the details, which I will not go over right now. First of all, because there's no time, and secondly, because there's too much information. But these are the 21 parameters. Um, and then, I actually have a definition. I promised a definition of translation, and here it is. A quality translation. I'd like to invite discussion through the rest of the day and for you to think about this relative to previous presentations. A quality translation follows specifications, that's the manufacturing aspect, that are appropriate to end user needs. Not just any set of specifications, but appropriate specifications. Avoiding social harm, often it's not a factor, but when it is, it's a very important factor. At the lowest available cost, but only relative to those specifications without compromising needed accuracy and fluency. Sometimes complete accuracy and often a high level of fluency are not required. So I believe that this definition not only encompasses the five aspects of quality that have been 
synthesized by researchers, but also addresses the various concerns that have been mentioned by previous speakers. I propose, I submit to you that this is a framework in which we can all work, and, we can, and there's room for every factor that has been mentioned as an aspect, as a component, a component of a definition of quality. Now, let me just uh, end by putting up um, an address. Um, let's see, maybe, maybe um, actually, maybe to me you can bring up a notepad window and I'll put in the address for the, for the information. Can you just in the, uh, a text pad, anything on the computer? Yes, anything, uh, oh, sure, great idea, I'll do it right there. Yep, thank you. So, www.ccc.org slash steps. S T E C S, and I'll just leave that up. That's where you can get. That's where you can get the uh, electronic version of the list of all the parameters and a short comment about each one. This is the basis behind the United States Standard for Translation Quality Assurance ASTM F 2575, and it's also the basis for the forthcoming ISO standard uh, 11669 and also consistent with the tradition of uh, Lanier and Christiana Nord. I'm familiar with Christiana Nord in the German uh, tradition of functionalism. It's the uh, work of many people. And finally, we have a translation theory that's relevant to everyday life. Comments and questions? Victor um, um, Genke, the World Translation Agency. Um, there's, I think this is a great definition, but I think the most problematic part of it are the words needed accuracy. It needs another definition. Hmm. Uh, th certainly, it's, um, we, have to we have to figure out how we decide whether, how, how much accuracy and fluency we need and how to measure it. You're right. But at least we have a framework within which we can work on that particular point. Um, and it makes it clear that accuracy and fluency are not always the primary criteria. And then we can say, okay, now how do we measure accuracy? How do we measure fluency? And how do we determine how much of it we need? But yes, a lot of, a lot of work left. You're right.